you, Connor. So good evening, everybody, and welcome to our second public meeting of 2021. Um, this is also uh, Galileo's birthday. And uh, as Galileo searched and, and explored the universe and unraveled the mysteries of the universe, tonight our speakers are going to be unraveling the mysteries of the public consultation process. So we have a great lineup of speakers tonight. We've got Phoebe Duvall from Antashka. She's the Planning and Environmental Policy Officer with Antashka. We have uh, David Clements from the, he's with the National Transport Authority. He's project manager and of the strategic planning section. We've got Dr. Damien Otuma, he's with, um, he's the National Cycling Coordinator, and he's with Cyclist.ie, the Irish Cycling Advocacy Network. We've got Marin O'Dee, she is the former chairperson of the Dublin Cycling Campaign. She's also now with the South Dublin Cycling Advocacy Group, which is one of our um, subgroups, as well as the Love 30 campaign. We have Aaron Bolger, who's We'll pop in in a second. He's the former infrastructure working group lead with the Dublin Cycling Campaign. And we also have Kevin Baker, who is our chairperson of the Dublin Cycling Campaign speaking as well. So um, before we get started, just a few uh, little bits of housekeeping. There's a Q&A section that you're welcome to um, ask any questions in the Q&A. We will, each of our speakers will be speaking for about six minutes and we will have time for a Q&A section at the end. So we will be keeping track of questions there. But of course, if you wanna to chat to any of the attendees, you can do, through, do so through the, through the chat. Um, this webinar is being recorded as well. So if you need to pop off early, you can always listen back later on our YouTube channel. And then also just a reminder that tomorrow the group, the Love 30 campaign is also having a meeting at 8 p.m. And Connor will, I believe, put a link to join that in the chat so you can sign up for the Love 30 campaign uh, meeting tomorrow. So we're going to start off with our first speaker, that's uh, Marin O'Dee, and she's going to talk to you about how to, to write uh, submissions. So off to you, Marin. Okay, thanks, Cynthia. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. I'm just going to share some slides with some notes. So um, I'm a long term member of the Dublin Cycling Campaign. And um, I think one of the, the, the first submissions I worked on was the one on the Grafton Street quarter. And then more recently, I worked on Bus Connects uh, submissions and um, Cycle South Dublin. Um, and definitely um, the campaign is doing far more submissions now in recent years. Uh, so it's, it's great to have this meeting um, to, share, to share what we know. Um, so the first thing I'd say, um, you, uh, if you're a bit um, intimidated about writing your submission, um, you shouldn't be. Uh, you should just start by, start by starting, do a short submission. Um, and uh, the thing is that the number of submissions is important. So it's not just, even if the cycling campaign is doing a very detailed submission, uh, we need lots of submissions by other cyclists because the number of submissions from cyclists versus um, say motorists is, is important. Um, if, you, if you're a bit intimidated about doing a submission by yourself, there's always, we're always um, looking for help um, on various submissions. So you can always offer to help uh, within the campaign. Uh, okay, another piece of advice. Um, I'm not great at me reading maps, so I always cycle the route. And um, I find it easier just to read the map and cycle the route. And it's great if you can get somebody else to join you, they, they'll give you a different perspective. Um, and it's worth bearing in mind that um, if you cycle a route regularly, you probably know more about it than the people who've designed the route. Um, they may have only looked at it uh, on a few occasions. So, and sometimes what looks good on paper might not be, um, for example, you might be aware of um, excessive speeds on, on a route or um, a, a cycle track where there's illegal parking. So it's not really going to work for people. Uh, just move on. Um, if there are public consultation meetings, I, I recommend going along. Um, it can be a bit intimidating, but even to turn up and bring your, bring your bicycle helmet with you uh, is, is making a statement. 
um, and, and speak up because um, often they're, they're dominated by um, individual motorists who, uh, who feel threatened by any changes to bring in cycling facilities. Uh, it's also important that um, public bodies and, and local politicians who go to consultation meetings hear, that, um, hear the voice of cyclists and what their concerns are. I also, um, I went to quite a few Bus Connects um, public consultations and uh, it was very interesting to hear what other groups had to say. Um, so things like how, how it affects parents bringing their children to school and disabled users. Um, and, and sometimes you, you'll uh, find other groups that, where you have common ground or that you can um, make a connection with and uh, discuss, discuss the, um, the submission. Um, so in terms of perspective, um, obviously the main thing is to write from your own perspective um, as a cyclist, how is it going to affect you? But also consider um, other people's perspective. You know, is it suitable for children to cycle? Um, and then would it encourage somebody who doesn't currently cycle uh, to take up cycling? Um, and how does it affect pedestrians, wheelchair users, and public transport users? Um, so and, um, in terms of the, the longer submissions that the cycling campaign um, sends in, the, the typical structure of these, um, an introductory section where we say whether we're broadly supportive of the uh, proposal or not, um, and then list what aspects of the proposal we, uh, we support. I think it's always important to um, write about the bits that you like, as well as the, um, the things you don't like about a proposal. Um, because it's, it's easy to get focused on all the negatives. And then usually there's a, a detail section where it goes through um, um, all the maps page by page and uh, referencing what are the good points and any concerns, um, and then a conclusion uh, with the main points. So that's just uh, uh, some points from, from my experience over the years of uh, writing submissions. So I'll stop sharing now. That, that's great, Marin. Thank you so much. Um, I especially liked your tip on cycling the route. I think that's really important, either cycling or walking the route, um, you know, just to, to, sometimes it's easier to be, to, to see what's going on um, live versus on, on a, on a map or on a piece of paper. So thank you for, for that. So next we'll go on to, uh, to Damien and, um, and so, Damien, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, brilliant. Can you see it okay there? Yeah. Uh, okay, good afternoon. Uh, uh, sorry, Damien. Oh, yeah, perfect. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. Now. Thanks. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, Damien Otuma is my name. I'm the National Cycling Coordinator with Cyclist.e and also on Tashka. And I um, want to say a little bit about submissions, but really to contextualize them and really say a little bit about where they fit into our, our toolbox of, uh, of the broader tools we use. And uh, as you'll see from the map there on the first page, we have 25 groups in the cyclist.e network. And really we're making submissions that the, the local groups, our member groups are making submissions at a local level, generally into local authorities, whereas cyclist.e is generally making them into national level bodies, uh, government departments and agencies, but we would also put them in to support our local groups as well, so as to provide uh, a further voice. So I'll pop on to the next slide. And um, earlier, just a couple of months ago, we uh, adopted a new strategy within Cyclist.e and there's, there's six strands to it. Um, we, we want to build a community um, nationally, a community of cycling advocates. We're looking to change the national conversation on cycling. We're looking to change public policy. Uh, we want to change how institutions work and legislation. We want more money for cycling, more public funding on cycling, and we're looking to change infrastructure. And of those six uh, strategic aims, really five of them, really the last five uh, submissions have a role in uh, advancing advancing um, advancing our aims. And uh, I'll pop onto the next one now. Uh, yeah, so really, really for five of those six strategic aims, uh, putting in 
high quality submissions is is the way is the way to go. Really, really important tool in creating change. So I suppose the, the next question is, well, who do we put in submissions to? And it's generally in response to statutory consultations, and these are formal um, formal consultations organised by um, um, could be government government departments. So um, I suppose one, one of the big ones we we would put a submission into is a pre-budget submission into the department um, the Department of Finance, and this would go in uh, during the summertime, and we would be looking to shape the the budget that happens later on in the year. Uh, a lot of our submissions go into the Department of Transport. Uh, one of the big consultations last year was the, was the Sustainable Mobility Policy, which has been, per, been prepared by the Department of Transport, and we're expected to see a draft of that sometime um, during the year. Then there's several different transport agencies that we would be putting submissions into. Um, the National Transport Authority is one of them. I'll be look, looking forward to hearing what uh, David is saying in, in later on in this session. Uh, the Road Safety Authority, there's a new road safety strategy being prepared by the Road Safety Authority at the moment. We put in a detailed submission last year on that and we'll be putting in a further one later in the year when we see a draft. And uh, then there's other bodies such as uh, the Office of Public Works and um, other, other agencies as well. Uh, there's 31 local authorities in Ireland and we would, cyclists.ie would put in submissions into uh, on, on some of the bigger schemes um, and, and that, and then there's other, other, other bodies as well. Um, so what's, just a few thoughts, a few reflections of what a quality, uh, what's a good quality submission. Um, I'm a fan of a, a, little, a simple little introduction, introduce yourself, um, you know, explain why you're putting in a submission and maybe just summarize the main arguments that you're proposing to put in. Um, I'm a devil for, um, for liking well-structured submissions. So if you have three main arguments, you know, you might want, you know, three main paragraphs or three pages if it's a, if it's a nice short submission. Um, ideally back up your arguments with, re with research. You know, you might want to cite a particular, maybe an environmental protection agency, uh, recent report on, on air quality. So if, if, if possible, back up your arguments with, uh, with research. Uh, you might want to finish it off with a, a simple little conclusion summarizing uh, your arguments. Uh, keep it concise. There's nothing wrong with the one page. We often put in one or two page submissions. Don't be shy about keep, keeping it nice and short, uh, short and brief, and you can put the detail uh, in appendices. And um, again, just keep your keep your submissions clearly written. If you have a friend who might read over it before you you put it in, uh, I think it's always worth the best um, the best the best best piece of writing have uh, have gone. You've written them several times and you've and you've double checked them. So look, that's that's a brief overview of what we do in, in the national organization. And um, if, if, you, if you imagine putting in a submission yourself, you're, 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 you're often following those same principles. So I'm happy to come back and um, elaborate on any of those points in the questions and answers. Thank you. That, that's great, Damien. Thank you. Good, just one question. When you do the, as the group uh, cyclist.ie, uh, when you do your submissions, do the, are they, then made public, for example, on your website. So for example, an individual can then use it as reference when they're making their own individual submission later. Yeah, it's a good question. We we try to put our submissions on the website. Now we don't we don't get them all up. We'll put the bigger ones up. And when we're super organized, we'll try to get a good draft up on the website maybe a week before the deadline. And then we'll circulate that draft to our members and to the public so they can have a look at the points we're making and maybe they might want to echo some of them in their own submissions. So yes, That's it's the short answer. Brilliant, thank you. So um, next we'll move on to uh, Phoebe Duvall. She's with Antashka. She's the planning and environmental planning officer with Antashka. So off you go, Phoebe. Thanks, Cynthia. And thanks very much for having me. Um, I wanted to zoom in a little bit and talk about uh, city and county development plans specifically, since that is um, a really a key category of consultations that um, that the public can can be involved in. Um, and a lot of you probably already know this, but uh, development plans are six. They run for six years, and they set out the vision and the policies um, for development in the county or city. So that covers zoning, housing strategy, transport, um, environmental management, 
um, economic development, climate change, or you name it. Um, but crucially, it sets out the policies that then all development, you know, planning applications, strategic housing applications, all development is assessed against. Um, so it's, they're, they're pretty important in terms of all categories of development um, in, in any given area. So the actual process of creating the plans is it's quite long. Uh, it's usually over two years. And it starts, I'll give you the abridged version, um, and highlight there's three, um, there's three main points at which public submissions uh, are accepted. And it's great to get involved at all three. So initially it starts out kind of halfway through the current plan, the council will do research, review the plan, that's currently in place, um, do baseline reports, things like that. And that all leads up to the publication of an issues paper, which is kind of the start of the pre-draft phase. And it's all mostly high level, looking at the broader visions for the county or the city, um, kind of the direction that, that, that the plan is going to take. Um, so that then that pre-draft consultation is opened up to the public for at least eight weeks. And that's a really good time to get a submission in that covers um, your sort of broad vision. There's no specific policies written out yet. It's, it's much more high level. Often the issues papers will ask questions. Um, you can answer those. You can also put in your own opinions either way. Um, we do both as on Tashka. Um, but it is good to just kind of lay out what you want to see could be very broad for covering multiple areas. It could be extremely specific. Um, one niche bit about cycling doesn't matter. It's totally up to you. Um, so then that, the, that consultation is reviewed and eventually then the draft plan is, is published. Um, and again, goes out to consultation. That's usually about 10 weeks. Um, and that's the point at which you can actually comment and critique individual, um, individual policies. It's good to say ones that you like, ones that you think should be changed, if anything is missing. Um, so that's, that's, again, can be as long as you want. You can cover the whole plan. You can cover one policy. It doesn't matter. It just is good to get your voice in, in whatever way, um, whatever way you feel like. There's no, there's no right or wrong, wrong way to do it. Uh, the key thing is that you're heard because you can put in something very technical. You can put in um, something very brief. It's just your opinion on a specific policy, either way, um, doesn't matter. Then that goes again for review and the council will come back with what's called material alterations. So they kind of, they'll go through and publish actually line by line the changes that they've made based on that consultation. And then you're again invited to comment. That's a bit, um, it's because the plan is getting close to finalization at that point, um, it's much more specific and can be quite, quite a lot of work to kind of parse through all the changes but it is worth still looking at, I would say. Um, so the, in terms of actually finding the resources to do this, all the councils will publish their plans when they're up for consultation and up for review on their websites. They're not all up at the same time. I would recommend um, checking out the Office of the Planning Regulator. Um, and I think a link will go into the chat shortly. They have a really handy tool that maps out county by county, city by city, where they are in the consultation process with links. I find it really useful for keeping track. Um, so when things are open- 60 seconds. The, perfect. The council will accept, so it kind of depends. Um, some have an online portal where you can make your submissions, which sometimes are chapter by chapter of the plan, you can also submit something on the whole plan. Um, they'll often also su accept submissions via email. 
uh, but regardless, they will accept hard copy of for any council anywhere. Um, it's really handy. You can also, all the plans are available online, which is great because you can word search them. So you can type in cycling if you're particularly interested in that. Um, you can also look at hard copies in council offices. Don't, don't know about COVID restrictions, but that's at least how it usually is. Um, so yeah, their bottom line is you're, all your thoughts are as valid as anyone else's. You don't have to be an expert. Um, it's just about getting involved and helping shape um, the places where you live and, and getting your voice heard. So yeah, thanks very much. That, that's brilliant. Thank you, Phoebe, so much. So um, uh, we did have a question come into the Q&A if there was a, uh, which we can get to later, but you, you, I think you touched on it briefly there. Is there a central area where you can see when submissions are due? And you're saying that's with the Office of the Planning Regulator, Regulator website. Brand. Yeah, I would say that's, that's one, it's a one-stop shop, basically, um, where you can find all, all, it stops, it, it saves you having to go to individual council websites and see what's going on. So I would recommend starting there. Perfect. Thank you so much. So um, next we're gonna move now to uh, David Clemens. He's with the National Transport Authority's project manager of the strategic planning section. So David, we will uh, pass on to you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Yeah, um, yeah. as I said, I'm, I work in the strategic planning section of the NCA. I'm a town planner um, and I work on a lot of the transport strategies and also um, as writing a lot of submissions myself on, as a, we were prescribed by body under the planning act so we comment on all the development plans local area plans and large-scale planning applications as well and some road schemes so i'm going to kind of talk about those two separate aspects like i spend a lot of time writing submissions and i spend a lot of time reading submissions that's basically most of my job um so just to give you some sort of ideas what what do i take into account when i'm setting out to write submissions on on these development plans on planning applications so like I think it's important to be kind of aware of the recipient of these submissions. What, what can they do? What, are, what is the role of the person and the agency and what's their res responsibilities? And so when they get your submission, what can they actually do with it? So, you know, what can they deliver? What can they do to deliver what you want and kind of what constraints they operate in? So like every agency, whether it's a county council or the NTA or um, any other national agency or whatever it is, they operate within kind of legal and political constraints as to what they can actually do. So, you know, there's there's very little merit in asking, say, you know, a local authority, for example, to to go against national policy if if that's something that, that you might be seen as desirable. So, um, and the other issue with that is what's realistically achievable at this particular stage in the process. I think Phoebe mentioned there's three stages in the development plan, for example. By the time it gets to material alterations. You know, a lot of the stuff that was there in the draft has already more or less been agreed and almost, you know, basically voted through already by the council effectively. And um, so you have to be kind of conscious of what stage you are in the process. I think what Mirren said earlier on, but starting with the positives, is is actually good advice just to set the tone in your submission as well. So we always try to be, you know, welcoming of a, of a proposal or a scheme or a or a plan or a policy to say, look, we re understand what the intent of the the instrument is is it to you know and, and generally in transfer policy now the move is to what has been towards the same transfer for a long time not every agency including the NCA gets it right every time but you know welcome the intent at least that it sets the kind of a, a good tone so we would say things like you know in principle this is a good thing before you know taking some aspects of it in detail and saying look we, we think you need to change these certain aspects so just that's kind of what I would do when I'm sitting down to write a, 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 a um, submission now. Um, in terms of when I receive submissions, I, I bear in mind, like, you know, going through things like Bus Connects, the network review in particular, I would have read thousands of submissions. Um, the Limerick strategy, the, the Dublin strategies over the years, transport strategies, I would have read all of these things. And I could get a good feeling for, you know, what, what, make, what actually make someone working in a state agency or a local authority make a change to a plan. Um, it's, it's not, it's certainly not just about volume of things because there's always campaigns. For example, our, our, our recent GDA transport strategy had a huge campaign from one particular area. 
and it dominated the entire survey. But we're not going to just act on that. So it's all about the other, the other aspects of it. So I was just written out like four basic elements to a submission, the length, the format, the relevance and the tone. The length has been touched on already. You can write a 10 pager or you know a two pager. You could even just write it in a single paragraph. Generally submissions come in via just simple emails. A lot of the submissions on Bus Connects are very short. Uh, I won't say any more on that, but they were they were you know to the point, you know, keep our bus. That's all it needed, you know. Uh, so the format as well, like I mean, you know, generally they're like I said, they're emails, people put in PDFs and stuff like that. So, you know, that's that's important as well. There's no need to, you can put in pictures and stuff and anything that's that really um same as any report really, anything that kind of makes it more presentable is always welcome and it, and it makes it easier for people to read as well. I mentioned sort of alluded to relevance earlier on, like what, what can a state agency do or, or local authority do? So I think keeping it relevant, I, what's, what's your main message here? Like, what are you trying to get across? Like, keep it to that. Um, some people or some, some respondents tend to bring in all sorts of issues into a submission on a, when, when it's probably best to keep it as quite focused as well. And the tone is important as well. I think, you know, we're living in a different kind of world to maybe 10, 15 years ago with, with things like social media where the tone is very, very different. I'm definitely seeing from my point of view, reading submissions over the years, that tone is starting to seep into formal submissions from members of the public. And yes, it definitely has crept into some uh, organizations' submissions as well. It, it doesn't really serve the organizations or the individuals well and it's just not a it's not a constructive engagement in that sense so i would be kind of wary of that uh, as well um, and even from my own perspective writing submissions on behalf of the nta um like there, there has been times in the past where we, we may have erred on or sorry veered towards uh the wrong tone and and we've you know with, with certain agencies or whatever it is um and it's not it doesn't actually uh it doesn't work that well so but generally like you know the the, the point there tonight is like trying to remove barriers there, there's and i know it can feel sometimes that agencies put up barriers and um, i don't think the nta has ever put up a barrier to submissions um, and i don't i don't think most local authorities try not to but the main thing is that they shouldn't be there there should you can say what you like kids can make submissions uh, they don't have to be um particularly well written let's say but they do have to try and make a point so i think um you know no one takes these things personally when they receive them so i think say whatever you like and within those kind of uh kind of elements of it that, that you need to be careful about and that never be concerned i wouldn't be uh, i'd say very easy for someone who's, who works in the to say this but i would never be concerned that your submission won't be read never be concerned that I won't be taken seriously and never be concerned that it's not good enough um, I know you've said you know get people to read it and check it which is a good idea but we take every every submission member of the public is taken seriously as far as I'm concerned and I, I, I can't speak for every planner and local authorities but I know that mo like, they will say that they take these things seriously so I think um, the best message I can give you today for writing submissions is not to be um, Try not to be intimidated by the process um, and you know be positive about what you're trying to do and get across your message as clearly as possible as concisely as possible and um, hopefully you'll see um, kind of the, the results of that when you when you see final plans i hope that's been of some assistance to you guys thanks that's brilliant david thank you so much um, just one question for you have, have you noticed during COVID? i mean with lockdown and you know people possibly having more time on their hands and able to attend Zoom meetings and, and you know, counselor, council meetings, or have you noticed that there's been an increase in submissions coming in to, to the NTA, for example, on, on any projects uh, in the past year? Or um, not, not necessarily. I mean, the Limerick, the Limerick strategy was the one that I looked after during last year and the level of engagement there was probably high, higher than it was in previous regional transport strategies. All right, um, I think like we have to remember we were coming off a couple of years of bus connects where we just got an unprecedented engagement. 
Like we have never, I don't think any agency has ever seen that before. Like, you know, we did the first phase, we got 11,000 submissions. That was on an, like an issues paper type of thing. And then we got 40,000 and then other, I don't know what was going on in the other projects with Plus Connect, but that was just the network review. So that was because, you know, of the, again, it's the, it was so close to people. Like it was, it was your bus outside your door being changed or potentially changed. So, you know, always you have to kind of, when you're gauging engagement, you have to say, well, what is the actual plan you're talking about here? Whereas a regional transport strategy isn't going to ever get that much. But having said that, our recent uh, issues paper for the Dublin strategy I referenced earlier on is is a massive amount of engagement as well. Not when your bus connects yet, but that's on the issues paper. So it is quite big because the NTA itself has become far more active in the last five years than it was in the previous five, just because we're bringing projects forward like Metrolink and Bus Connect. So I think um, I'd, I'd, I'd ask that of the city council more than ourselves because they you know, they do development plans every six years and have done for many years. Um, every um, Each one of those processes has been identical more or less since the 1960s. So it's, it's uh, whereas the NTA is slightly different, each project we do is slightly different. Uh, but definitely, um, and get uh, what's the wrong? Public engagement is much higher now because things like, and I'm sure you're the same with your own organization. You've WhatsApp groups, you've Facebook groups, you've Twitter, you've all these things, and people can engage very easily and shoot off a submission in no time. Whereas in the past, they would have had to put more time into it. And I think that's kind of increased engagement. Um, but I haven't seen a COVID impact on engagement yet. But you have to bear in mind that our ability to go out to people has been. Yeah curtailed as well so it works both ways great thank you so uh we appreciate that david and now we're going to uh move on to aaron uh bolger aaron is the former infrastructure working group lead with a dublin cycling campaign and he will give us his insights now on the submission process hey cynthia um i i want to make some points that I, I there's a few points that have been made already so i i, I prefer not to rehash them. I know some people have said that it's it's an, it's a numbers game in some sense. Um, and that's very true. Um, you know, I think when I, because I'd be heavily involved with writing the official campaign submissions. And I, and I worry sometimes that people look at the submissions that we write and think, oh God, I couldn't possibly write that. Because our submissions tend to be quite technical. Um, they tend to be not very personal. And they tend to refer to a lot of, you know, technical documents and reports and traffic counts and things like that. Um, and I think it's very important to, to remember that your personal submission does not have to look, in fact, it shouldn't look anything like the sort of detail or, or, or technicality that we, we write in the official campaign submission. So don't be daunted um, by, by the submissions that come from us. Uh, we do normally try to, you know, uh, pr provide a summary on our website that is, you know, easier to, to read than the official submission might be. Uh, I don't know how good our, we are at doing that, but maybe some feedback would be would be good. Um, but just to give one example, um, you know, a few years ago, the first round of Bus Connects, um, the just what, uh, the proposal for Rathmines Road is one that that I think is is a good example. Um, because the original proposal for Rathmines Road was, this is the busiest corridor for cycling in the country. Um, and the proposal originally was quite poor. It was removing cycle lanes uh, on this incredibly busy road. Um, this was the first time that I was involved with where the campaign went on a really, really um, sort of intensive submission drive where we stood on the, on the canal uh, bridge for a whole week during the morning and evening rush hours, handing out flyers, uh, we got over a thousand submissions relating to Rathmines Road from people cycling. Most of those submissions were not detailed. They were simply saying things like, you know, I cycle down Rathmines Road to get to work, or uh, my kids are in school on, on or near Rathmines Road, and we need to be able to get there safely. You don't need to have the solutions. You don't need to know what would make it safer. But simply saying, please make it safer, is enough. And the result was, because the submissions were so overwhelming, not only did they choose a more aggressive approach um, in terms of 
car restrictions, they actually dumped their two options and replaced it with an even more um, aggressive restriction, which meant an even, even better facilities for cycling. So that was with mostly simple submissions. A lot of them, just a paragraph long, simply saying, I don't know what you need to do, but just make it safer to, to cycle and it can be effective. Um, so make it personal. I cycle on this road. I do this. This is how, how it will impact on my life. Um, and I'd also say make it local. One thing that we have seen in, in, in the last couple of years is that we've become, since, since that um, experience with Rathmines Road, we've become quite good as a campaign at mobilizing people to write submissions. We've done it a few times now. Um, not every time has been as, as effective as Rathmines Road. There have been times where we might get you know, 90, 95% of submissions in support of a scheme, but then the scheme gets held up or even scrapped entirely. Uh, and often the problem is that while an overwhelming majority of people responding uh, support the scheme, if there is resistance from local groups, residence groups, these sorts of uh, issues, um, councils can get, uh, can get nervous. So what I think is, is, is very helpful when you're writing your submission is don't just, um, don't allow the, per, the, the, the council or, or the official reading uh, your submission to view you just as a cyclist that is passing through an area. Um, you know, you, you've got, if the residence groups can say, well, we live in this area, so therefore, you know, a couple of dozen submissions from residence groups should count in some sense for more than a few hundred submissions from people who cycle through the area. But if you talk about, well, I don't just cycle through the area, I also shop in the area, or I go to school in the area, or whatever it may be. If you talk about how you use the area rather than just cycle through it, um, I think that can make a more effective submission. Um, because people are resistant to the idea of turning their community into just this sort of thoroughfare for people cycling to other destinations. But if people, um, the decision makers know that these submissions from cyclists are coming from people who also use shops and local facilities, um, then I think they, they, they will carry more weight. So seconds. That's, that's, uh, that's just what I, what I gotta say. There's, it's, a, it's a numbers game. The submissions don't have to be complicated. Make them personal. Uh, and make them local and uh, write something, anything is good. That's uh, brilliant, Aaron. Thank you so much. I, I really like your suggestion about the fact that you don't have to find the solution. I think that's something that often um, prevents people from putting in a submission because they go, well, wow, well, what is the solution? How do I make this road better? Yeah. It's it, you, you don't need to find the solution. You just need to say that it's you don't feel safe cycling on that route or walking along that route. Um, and, you know, you, you don't have to be the engineer of the solution, but you just need to make your voice heard. So that's a really, really valid point. So thank you for that. Um, we're going to close off tonight with our with our final speaker. It's Kevin Baker, he's the chairperson of the Dublin Cycling Campaign. So I uh, will pass you along to Kevin and then we'll have our Q&A afterwards. Perfect, thank you very much, Cynthia. Um, I just have a few slides. I'm honestly not gonna cover a lot of ground. I'm gonna cover much of the same ground as everyone else. This is kind of gonna be a bit of a summary and conclusion to some extent. Um, okay. What I want you to remind you of is what is Dublin Cycling Campaign trying to achieve? We're trying to achieve a vibrant, livable city where everyone can enjoy everyday walking and cycling. To some extent, we're a campaign of ideas. If decision makers, the people in councils uh, and government bodies and engineers believed in these same core ideas as strongly as we did, there would be change. So what are kind of some of the big ideas I'd encourage you to try and get into your submissions? That cycling can be an option for everyone if we design for it. Cycling can be an option for you to cycle with your kids to school if it was designed properly. Um, cycling could be an option for you to cycle to the shops to do your weekly shopping if it was safe. These are kind of big core ideas 
that to some extent more decision makers in Arda need to hear. Don't labor the point, just get it in there one or two sentences. Streets are for people. Like there, there's an element of this campaign is about changing the way we do public space in Dublin so that there is more space for people to sit, to walk, to cycle, to enjoy their local community. That there needs to be safe routes to school and local quiet routes. Um, I really love this photo on the bottom right. Um, what I really like about it is it came from a tweet from a father who cycles with his daughter to school. She actually now cycles independently. Um, but a, the tweet caption was something along the lines of, this is real cycle infrastructure. That plastic rubbery curb on the right was the confidence and the safety that that parent needed to let their kids cycle to school on their own. To some extent, that might be all of the level of detail that you need to provide in some submissions. I won't let my kids cycle to school unless it looks like that. Okay. Four really quick reasons why you should do public consultations. It's about sharing these key ideas with decision makers. It's about providing your personal perspective. What will it mean to you? How will it change your life? It's about showing support, hopefully for a good scheme or showing opposition to something which doesn't like cut the mustard. And then the last thing is about suggesting changes. We kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but Dublin Cycling Campaign doesn't do submission templates. Um, there's a few reasons for this. When an agency gets duplicate submissions that all come in on the same template or that all have the same copy pasted lines, they end up in one bucket. Um, agencies and government bodies, they're looking for lots of individual perspectives. They're looking for people who put the five minutes to put their own thoughts even if it's two sentences down onto a piece of paper. A copy pasted submission is not that. It doesn't show the same thought and so they get ignored. So we don't do them. What Dublin Cycling Campaign will try and do is post our public cons our, our submissions online early enough with what we normally try and keep as like a 300 word summary on the website with a few bullet points in it. Feel free to take our bullet points mix them in with your personal perspective. And hey, presto, in the space of five minutes, you could have the submission response that you need. My kind of two cents on what makes a good submission is kind of, I suppose like some advice for these public consultation submissions is follow Dublin Cycling Campaign and kind of other organizations like us to know what's happening. It can be hard to keep on track of all of the kind of different public consultations that are happening in every area. Um, ask for advice. So look out for when organizations like Dublin Site Campaign put their submission online. Send us an email if you want advice as to like what we think about these things. Um, keep it short and simple. I'm sure David is probably fed up of reading some of our 10 page submissions. Um, the cycling campaign is probably the biggest offender of writing too much stuff. Um, you need to remember that there is a person on the other end of this who needs to read your submission. And as David was saying, they frequently need to read hundreds or thousands of these submissions. And it can take days, weeks, or even months for staff to read through all of the submissions. Keep them in mind when you're writing them. The shorter you can make it and the more concise you can keep it, the better their day is going to be. Make it scannable. One of the things people who read submissions need to do is they need to categorize what are the issues that are coming in. Um, they might also need to do something like figure out a, like a rough count of how many people were in favor, against, or kind of neutral on a topic. Try and make your submission as scannable as possible. If your submission is more than a paragraph or two, use bullet points and use headings. Make it so that the person who's reviewing your submission can look at it in the space of 10 seconds pick out your key points and figure out where you stand on them. And then the last bit here is follow the 80-20 rule for feedback. Kind of Phoebe and David touched on this quite a lot. A lot of these, like figure out what kind of feedback or what stage the agency is, is at. If they're at an early options report or an issues paper, they are very early in the process. They may have done less than 80% of the work you want to give them small bits of high-level feedback. 
if you start going on to Dublin City Council and their development plan about double yellow lines at the end of your road or how they need a cycle lane on this street in an issues paper, it's irrelevant to them. They're not there yet. Um, and then as the process develops, you want your feedback to get more detailed, more specific. So figure out, are they looking for high level feedback or are they looking for really detailed stuff? Um, I suppose my last point is there's too many public consultations to do them all. Um, these are just some of the ones that have happened in the last six months. The NTA's review of the transport strategy for Dublin. There's been two on Strand Road. There was the 16 bus connects corridors. There was College Green. There was the R132 in Swords. There was Lewis to Finglas. There's the Dublin City Development Plan. There's the Phoenix Park. There's overall roundabout in South Dublin. And I probably even haven't covered 15% of them. Prioritize the ones that are most important to you. Do the ones that are local to you. Uh, do the ones that will have the biggest impact on your life. Um, keep it simple and just try and do your best. If you miss one, so what? Um, the only other piece of advice I can give you is share these with other people. To some extent, all of these government agencies are looking for feedback. They're looking for more perspectives. So share these with your friends and family uh, and try and get as much public engagement on these as possible. That's it. That's brilliant, Kevin. Thank you so much. Um, before we get to the q and I, I have a question for you. Um, is it worth when you've made your, your submission for the public consultation to also email your local county councillors, letting them know of your submission and what you've, you've said in your submission? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's probably one of the simplest low cost things you can do. Like once you've gone to the trouble of writing the submission, be it two lines or one page or 10 pages, Emailing it to your counselors is a really easy thing to do. Most counselors won't read every submission to a public consultation. Most of them will only read what's called the public consultation report, which is where some staff in the agency has kind of condensed what were the key points and some of the kind of uh, responses from the kind of the agency to those points. So if you want to make sure that the local counselors understand your point of view, you need to email them. Brilliant. Thank you. So um, we will go on to our Q&A now. Um, we've got have a few questions have come in through the Q&A that we will go through and then, but feel free to keep popping in some, some questions um, and we'll try to get through as many as we, we can. I just want to uh, thank all of our speakers again, though, for 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 joining us this evening and for for sticking along here now for the Q and A. So we we had one question about the central area, and we we've covered that one already. Um, the next one is uh, the county development plans follow on from the regional spatial and economic strategies, but these can become out, outdated, e.g. new climate targets, be they national or EU targets. So how do we get around long-standing plans that are still influencing? county development plans. So um, I think Phoebe, would you be happy to answer that? Yeah, I, absolutely. That's, that's true. Um, we actually link as, as a prescribed body that, that comments on development plans, we encounter that a lot and we bring it up. Um, if there's something outdated in a draft, we'll say, we'll mention it. Um, but also obviously, you know, the draft stage is only one part of it. Development plans are valid for six years, so things change within six years. Um, but things like EU policy is still relevant. So there are times when we make submissions on planning applications and something has changed um, that may impact a development plan policy, but we'll, we'll still highlight that well, actually current EU level policy or current national level policy says this. So I think the key thing is there just when you're engaging in any consultation, be it a, a policy consultation, a development plan, or an individual planning application, just bring it up. Um, make sure you highlight that because it can, the, the policy world is so complex and there's so many moving parts. Um, I think the key for us as the public and as campaigners and as as different bodies is to just bring it up make sure it's noticed 
and sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but they can't you know nothing will change if we don't say it okay and also can i just on the on the other question there's one yet the the central area for consultations um i'll pop the link in the chat but there is on gov.ie there's a whole here there's 800 things on it right now of of consultations from all departments um county level stuff very local stuff uh, so it's a bit it's a lot to go through but it is follow all kevin so follow kevin's advice and pick the ones that are important to you, to you. yeah i'll put that link in though perfect um and then there's Can the I next come yes. in on the like the different policies all having i've seen that issue a few times uh, one of the kind of stories that stands out most to me is there's a thing called the um eastern bypass for dublin it's a road project from dublin port either over or under like the strand of Dublin Bay that links then up to the M50. It's about completing the ring. Um, it's been an almost impossible project to get removed from the Dunleary development plan or the Dublin city development plan because the Dublin transport strategy references it. We tried to get it removed from the Dublin transport strategy, but the regional strategy references it. And sometimes you try and get it removed from the national strategy, but they're like, but it's in the regional strategy, so we probably should include it too. So sometimes we can get caught in these policy loops, but hopefully it should be rare enough. Well, that's perfect. This follows into the next questions. Could I just ask with, this is anonymous, could I just ask with regard to targets on city transport strategies, if these seem not being ambitious enough in line with our necessary transport emissions reductions, so in that way our, our national strategy, then that is kind of fundamental to the entire strategy. How is that best handled in the public consultation process? Um, well, I come in on that one? Yeah, David, do you take that one? <clears throat> Um, yeah, as regards to the regional transport strategies or the, the city transport strategies, like what we put in, what was published for them, for example, in Limerick and Cork, it was slightly misinterpreted as being targets when it was actually model input. So we have a whole area of work we have to do on that. And, um, and we've been working with the local authorities on modal split targets now. And I don't know if any of you will see our any of our submissions on the development plans that have been recently, we have uh, moved towards with the planning regulator to put in targets to everything. So um, it, it, as far as that, I mean, it's hard to answer that question because I'm dealing with one at the moment where we're, we're just saying, look, this isn't the target. We're going to put in a target. So in, into the regional transport strategy in the future. So for cycling in particular and walking, uh, there's a bit of work to be done on public transport as well. So really, that's it. It's it's not j just be careful about like there's a lot of fat figures put into these strategies and look, they can be misinterpreted or, or they're not quite what they might seem. So um, I think that's the there's no real. I'm sorry for not giving a very straightforward answer to that, but I wouldn't be what you've seen in the public domain in those transfer strategies are not as much a cause of concern uh, uh, as we go forward in in finalising those strategies or indeed. In our in, in our kind of the interaction with the local authorities um, in their development plans and stuff like that. Um, I hope that's kind of addressing some of that. Sorry. Yeah. Can I come in here for a second? Yeah. yeah. I don't want to throw David or the NTA under the bus, but I think the current strategy for Dublin predicts out to twenty thirty five that emissions will become stable; they won't drop. Um, and and like that was the old plan from six years ago. And but I suppose yeah. like. If you're if you're kind of really serious about climate change and you're kind of listening in here and trying to figure out what you can do, I suppose just make sure that when the NTA do release their updated transport strategy, which I think will be in the next six months to a year, yeah. uh, the objective is emissions reduction. Yeah, like I, I don't want to get into this at uh, this forum and um, just to say that like first of like the main thing to cover that is like it's a very very conservative thing and the mo most important thing to remember when it comes to modelling. And you are just you are just referencing a transport model here. You're not referencing anything else. Is that like it, it, those things? Like we, we couldn't we assume the same fleet, for example, which we all know is not the case. We all know that. I have an electric car. Some of you have electric cars. There's going to be loads more electric cars. The public transport fleet is going to be fully electric in a matter of time. So I think where we got caught out a little bit on that stuff on targets on emissions is is that we some of the modeling stuff became front and center of these strategies 
when it's actually off to the side here front and center is actually what we're going to do on the ground so it's a little bit and um, you know i wouldn't say predict either it's 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 more of a an, a, an appraisal process it's not the it's not fundamental but if you come uh, similar enough to like things like uh the higher level of engagement modeling transport modeling has become very very um it's been looked at in much more detail than it has been in the past so it's something we have to be aware of and i think we are now <laughs> And uh, changes will be made to how we report on things in the future. Um, I hope. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give this question over to, to Murrin. This is from Lauren. Um, do folks try to include people in their community who don't typically engage in public consultations? And do we have a responsibility to organize in our communities? Cycling campaigners tend to be professionals with third level education. So how do we bring along working class or disadvantaged communities? Would you have any insights on that? Um, well, I, I think there's a few different ways um, that I can think of that you can engage with um, your local community. Um, through schools is one way if you're, if you're have children at a local school, then you're going to be meeting parents there, and you may find other parents who who also want to you know, want safe routes to school. Um, residents associations is another way um, to bring up uh, topics that are going to affect people in the area. Um, what else? Uh, sports clubs as well. Another another way. So. Um, I think people have a responsibility to get involved in their community, whether to organize, um, it, it's up to the individual, but uh, there, there's lots of ways to engage with other people in the community and uh, both to share your ideas with them and also to find out more about how it, how it will affect them. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think sometimes people make, you know, put the weight of the world on their shoulders and you, you can only do what you can do and absolutely try to do you know, make your submissions, maybe let that get that out publicly to to friends and colleagues and even to, you know, passerbys on, you know, people that you might be meeting out, um, out and about or in schools. Um, but in terms of other ways to engage, I know, for example, I just randomly stop anybody on a bicycle when I'm on my bicycle, if there's a public consultation coming up and, and talk to people at, at traffic lights. Um, so uh, to next, um, I'll, I'll read this question out and see who, who wants to take it. To what extent can council simply ignore submissions? For example, if only a handful of submissions are made on something, say calling for segregated cycle lanes instead of using shared paths, do they have to take that on board or can they simply ignore and do their original plans? Um, you know, Damien, would you like to? weigh in on that? I think it's, look, it probably depends on the council and um, maybe depends on the quality of the submission. Um, and sometimes it's difficult to figure out the exact impact that your high quality submission has had um, on a council, but maybe maybe David might have some reflections on, on that one. Yeah, I I think ignore is is, a strong word sometimes it can feel like you've been ignored <clears throat> but you got to remember that the person receiving the submission either can't do what you're asking because there's other things that are other forces acting upon them or they disagree with you and i think that's another thing that we have to all be aware of when we write submissions is that that authority might not agree with what you're saying um, but it certainly, I, I, and then, then you don't see your submission reflect in the final plan or final scheme. But I wouldn't say it's it's ignoring um, and just doing the original plans. I think, and if you look at the kind of, again, I think Damien's right. It, it depends on the council and, and and the project managers and stuff like that as well. Um, so they taking something on board doesn't necessarily equate to doing that exact thing. Do you know what I mean? Sort of, you know. You can, if you say one thing and someone else says the opposite, you've taken them both on board and you've gone in the middle or you've gone one or the other, um, which is kind of what happens often. So they can't ignore submissions really, like they shouldn't be ignoring submissions, I think. Do you, do you think then it's a, like Aaron's advice about letting the, you know, in your submission, making um, 
the the um, the NTA or the county council letting them be aware of how you use the area is that really important then to make that put that in your submission as well so if you're not a resident but you're using that area making them aware of how you use it should that be does that weigh heavily on in in your submission i think that was brilliant advice that it should be local and personal and make sure you tell the agency the local authority or ourselves how you use the space that's the most important thing our experience and it goes back to the other question on how you um, engage working class or disadvantaged communities our experience of the bus connects network review uh was it changed a lot of our views of consultation or mine anyway sorry i can't speak for the nta i want to speak for myself here um but like when people looked at you and said like i have to bring my child on that bus to get from here to here or, you know, and similar to what you're saying, Aaron, I want my child to have a cycle along here. Uh, I don't know which counselor said it years ago, but uh, it's been, I've used it myself a few times. So like, if, uh, what did he say? It was something along the lines of a 12 year old girl can't cycle from Stevens Green to Parnell Square, we failed. And I think it's a very good statement to make that like, you know, we have to fix these areas, including right through the city center. Um, and I think making a person like that is very important. And I think it does, it does help get these things across. And I think it's, it's, um, you know, I, I, and again, I'm, they don't ignore these submissions, but again, it's, it's you have to kind of be aware of whether the engineer reading it actually agrees with you or not. And, you know, I've been in positions in, in the NTA where we've not, they have not agreed with us, have, have gone ahead with the plans. Perfect, thank you. Um, this question is from Joe Highland. What's the best approach to submissions on development plans if they include good cycling projects, but they never get done and roll on plan to plan with no progress? Um, Phoebe, would you want to yeah. weigh in on that? It's definitely an issue. Um, it's an issue with a lot of things with development plans. Um, I think the important thing is is to bring that up in the submission and say that you know tell them your opinion about about the scheme and say that you think it's good and that you'd like to see it you know advanced again in the next plan because it didn't get done um and you know it's important to to note that the the counselors are heavily involved in this process and they sign off on the plan and they want your vote so i think it's good to you know we as we've all been saying, the more local people weighing in saying, actually, you know, I think this was a really great idea. Why didn't get, why didn't it get done? Um, let's make sure it gets done next time. I think that actually the more people saying that, I think the better. So just don't be afraid to point out those things and say, this is great. Let's make sure it gets done next time. Because I think that does, yeah, like David was saying, they, they, they will, they will listen. They will look at that kind of thing. Can I add two cents here? Absolutely. I think it's useful to keep in mind sometimes that the the people who are reading your submissions, like if you talk to the staff in Dublin City Council, they totally get cycling, um, some more than others. And they know why it's a public good and why the city should be doing more of it. Um, and to some extent, they're as frustrated with the lack of progress as you might be. Um, just know that submissions are only one element of how you can create change. Um, maybe the change the change is not with the officials and their attitudes and policies. Uh, I think if you actually look at the Dublin City Development Plan and some of our plans for Dublin in general, they're ambitious. And our, our, I suppose our issues have been we haven't delivered on the ambition. Um, that's not always down to the staff. It's sometimes down to a lack of funding or a lack of support from councillors. Um, so know that like submissions are really useful and they can help create change, but they're not our only means of creating change. Um, there's lots of other things we can do to support um, the change we need to see. Perfect, thank you. Um, we're just at uh, 8.35, so might ask a few more questions if that's okay with the panel. Yeah. Um, don't want to keep everyone here, anyone here too late. Um, this question is from Kevin Corrigan. Uh, if there are upgrade works planned on paths or roads but are not open for public consultation, what is the most effective way to get views across to the local authority? 
um, I would think to email your county councillor and let them know there, but I would be curious to hear, um, Kevin, I think, could you weigh in on this one? What's the best way to let people? Yeah, okay. So the vast, 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 vast majority of changes to kind of paths and roads will go through some kind of public consultation. It might only be a quick four week one, um, or it may be a much longer eight week or 12 week process. The only thing I can think that doesn't happen with kind of public consultation is kind of road resurfacing. And I think sometimes we miss an opportunity to widen out cycle lanes or slightly repaint the, the road markings when we do road resurfacing, which is more of a policy issue with the, the city officials than it is. It's, it's also really hard to know when the road resurfacing project is going to happen. There's not a lot of details published online about those kind of things. Phoebe, There's yeah. also, um... A lot of those, like Kevin was saying, they go through what are called part eight consultations where the council is basically applying to themselves um, for permission to do like road upgrades. And those are all on the council websites um, and on the gov.ie consultation list. So yeah, those, they are available online um, if you wanna take a look for, for anything like that. And a lot of times they do include new footpaths, new cycle lanes. So it's worth keeping an eye on those lists as well. I think there should be an app for that. I think there actually should be an alert on your phone that if something is happening in your local area, a submission is going up, you should get an alert on your phone. If someone wants to make that, that would be brilliant. Um, uh, poor, poor Kevin, you've given him another job to do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, David? Sorry, just I think um, if you sign up to your local councillor's mailing list, those type of jobs always, or those type of projects tend to be, they tend to send them out as they're coming in because they'll be aware of obviously of part eights, for example, and they'll be publicising that. So I think that's always a good way to get to know what's going on in your area is to, they'll, the councillors will send out a mailing list to their mailing list every week or so, or whatever it is. It's a good way to do it. Absolutely. And that's what I was just saying, like to, to effective way to get views across to the local authority is also to really be in contact with your local uh, county councillor because um, they don't hear from many people so when they do hear from from you they they do uh, tend to respond and uh, I know I'm on quite a few mailing lists so mm. it is worth letting them know that you're there. Um, the next question is for you David as well it's from Sheila. David could you explain what you mean by the additional work on modeling outputs is needed and whether they include multi modal interventions yeah I, I really don't want to get into kind of the, <laughs> the work of the nta in detail here but yeah it's it's just some additional um like the models are being upgraded and tweaked all the time so yeah i mean cycling is is in there it's just not as developed as the traditional highway modeling and all that's been on for decades so yeah there is stuff being done there and um hopefully we'll be able to model cycling better in the future near future Perfect, thank you. So we just have two more questions that we'll go through real quick. Um, what, this one is from Tom Swithenbank. What is your take on petitions? Is it too easy to make and sign a petition to make them valuable? Um, in a, against active travel, the, the anti-petition will always get more responses. So it doesn't work to try and fight it in my opinion. Um, curious, uh, Kevin, do you wanna weigh? Yeah, I have thoughts here. Um, I, I suppose it's based on some of the things I've heard kind of officials and councils around the country say. Uh, there's a lot of people who don't put a lot of weight in, in petitions. It's too easy to some extent for if you're a local resident and you don't really care one way or the other in order to get that person in that WhatsApp group off your back, you'll sign your name. Um, at the same time, I've also seen petitions that have been done really, really well. Um, I have seen local groups, local community groups, particularly kind of in Stony Batter and Inchicore, go door to door, get people's feedback, um, kind of like a petition, but they're also kind of taking points of view and kind of trying to create like a, the entire community feels this sentiment. So it's not just a, a name signed at the end. It's a, it's a kind of, they're trying to like almost collect submissions door to door that kind of more like petition I've seen have a lot more success and be a lot more valuable. So not all petitions are awful, but I don't think they're a good go-to method. 
Can I just add um, that I know in the Fitzwilliam cycle route scheme, there was a petition uh, which had a few dozen signatures um, and Dublin City Council, when they published their report on the consultation, they treated it as a single submission, uh, which the residents did not appreciate. Um, so, you know, if, 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 if a councillor is just reading that report and looking at the numbers, you know, it looks like just one submission in terms of, you know, the number of submissions for versus the number against. So that's how they count it. Um, I think we have just one more question to go through here. Sorry. And then uh, we might just wrap it up. So this is a question to David. So taking the make it personal point on board when making submissions to the local authorities or NTA, is it beneficial to include uh, specific reference documents, design guidance, for example, or is this overkill? It's not overkill at all. Sure, I do, do it myself all the time and the submissions from the NTA. So it's, yeah, I think it is kind of, it's important because I mean, we do have, we are, local authorities are bound by these guidance documents, uh, particularly DMRs being government guidance, our government guidelines. Um, so no, it's not overkill. It's they're certainly not overkill. Perfect. We have, um, I think that's all the questions questions that have come in there's we've gotten to most of them there so um just to say um does anybody have any closing thoughts that they want to to say before we wrap things up for this evening I'm two small bits of housekeeping as usual. Um, Perfect. The Love 30 meeting, uh, which is a campaign for lower speed limits across the country, is happening tomorrow at 8 p.m. You'll find information for that on love30.ie. So if you want to get involved in that and help create lower speed limits in your area, it's a great way to get involved. Um, as always, Dublin Cycling Campaign, we are a charity. Uh, we, are we are kind of funded through your support and your membership. Um, if you can spare... A 20 quid a year for the membership. Um, it really does go a long way through supporting us and the work we need to do, um, like running the website or printing leaflets or et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if you can, please do support us. If you know someone who isn't a member and should be a member, uh, feel free to drop them the link dublincycling.com slash join. That is perfect. So I want to uh, just wrap up uh, firstly, by thanking all of our speakers, we really appreciate your time this evening, Phoebe, David, uh, uh, Damien, Aaron, Murren, and Kevin, we really appreciate you being with us. And of course, Connor and Mairead for organizing uh, tonight's talk it was brilliant. We really appreciate all, all the work that you put into this. Um, and just to say that we hope that everyone feels inspired by the end of this evening, you know, to to make your voice heard either in your own individual submission for, for a county development plan or if there's a cycle lane that's going in near you or you know it doesn't have to be always about cycling it could be other public realm improvements in your area so hopefully you feel inspired to do your own individual submission or to get involved with your local um, you know, cycling campaigning group. There's Dublin Cycling Campaign, there's Dunleary Cycling Campaign, which is a, a subgroup, Fingal um, Cycling Campaign Group and South Dublin County um, Campaign Group as well. Or perhaps there's another community organization that you wanna get involved and in working with a group submission. We always love to hear from you and, and your viewpoint. So uh, we hope that uh, our speakers tonight inspired you to, to get involved uh, with that. So, and then, um, everything for how to join Dublin Cycling Campaign is in the chat, as well as a link to the Love 30 um, group and, and their meeting tomorrow that you can sign up for. So I think uh, without further ado, is that? Great. Thanks a million. Connor, are we happy to kind of keep this going if people want to kind of join and join the conversation we normally go to the pub after a meeting but yeah. we haven't done that in a while so if people want to kind of <laughs> hang around and kind of join the zoom conversation you're more than happy to stick around and kind of join the conversation we might split out into breakup groups if we're too big but yeah 
and we stop the recording i think then so that is that right yep uh, yeah so yeah so yeah Cynthia just, just to say thanks a million for sharing uh, is th uh, thanks obviously to all the co-presenters co but Cynthia thanks for effortlessly and at last minute taking over as chair um so well, thanks Una, Una had a baby so she has an excuse <laughs> so uh, <laughs> yeah okay. we, 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 if, if Una is watching this uh, god forbid congratulations time, but congratulations we're all really delighted to hear the good news so thanks a million Okay, so I'm going to stop the recording now. And yeah, and 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 for.